Welcome to the Navigating Change in the Workplace Digital Summit, brought to you by Motivator Music. Featuring five expert speakers, Helen Williams, speaker and founder of HMW Sports, LLC. Steve Stasak, speaker and founder of Leader Speakers Training Company. Edward Moorfield, speaker and world-renowned coach. Tori Smith, speaker and founder of the Empathic Gangster Lifestyle Brand. Maya Madcore, international keynote speaker. Now, welcoming expert guest speaker, Helen Williams to the virtual stage. When you talk about office morale, normally you would think office outings, offsite retreats, office parties, you know, team activities. But today I want to talk about the day-to-day -day things that I think are necessary to um, have buy-in and make sure that your employee morale is high. Now, the first thing that you should think is that all of your people matter. Um, you would think that that is a fundamental tenet of any organization, um, but it's not always practiced. If I asked you who your key personnel is, more than likely you would say the CFO, the CEO, the COO, the CIO would be on your executive staff and they would be key personnel. But who really is the glue to your organization? Would your first or second thought even be the uh, accountant, the electrician, the custodian, the administrative assistant? These are people that make organizations go and you wanna make sure that they, as well as everyone else, has a positive environment with which they can reach their potential and do their best in whatever their area is. So I just wanna bring home that not everybody leaves an organization because of money. Um, money's important and it, it's good, but there also are small things that I think all leaders should do uh, enable uh, to enable them to have a positive culture, to have a positive employee morale. So obviously the first thing I think is to empower your people, right? You want them to take ownership. You want them to seek ownership and because people are more likely to be invested if they feel that their contributions matter, uh, if they're a part of, uh, you know, whatever is going to make the organization grow. So you have to do a couple of things. You, you, you need to make sure that you give them the opportunity, but really important is that you need to support them with those opportunities. You, you don't want to throw someone in the pool without teaching them how to swim. And so this is there are two ways, I think, to, to show this support. Uh, the first is tangible, right? You um, wanna have the budget, you wanna have um, mentorship, you wanna have training, um, and you wanna make sure that people are capable when you give them new responsibilities. Uh, I recently read a really good book by John Cotter. It's called Leading Change. And in that book, he talks about uh, competitive capacity. And what that means, his description of competitive capacity is competitive drive plus lifelong learning. So I think this is something that um, needs to be a part of your leadership. How are you developing your people? Uh, you as the leader, basically you're the head coach and you have to make sure that your people have what they need. Are you training your people um, to make sure that they develop in, the, in, in different areas to grow your organization? are you as a person doing the same thing? So you feel good about what you're doing with your staff to make your organization grow. The second kind of uh, support is really the intangible. It's like a soft skill. You can't really quantify it, but you know if it's there. You know if it's not there. And these are things where um, you wanna make sure that you don't lower your standards. Obviously, you're still gonna have the expectations, but you need to see your people, and I say see your people in quotes because uh, you can look right at someone and not see them. Your people need to feel seen. When I was a head coach, I had this athletic director who his favorite team was our men's hockey team, and uh, they were very good, and they won a lot. Um, this is the only team that he paid attention to. He literally would walk through um, 
a, a lobby and there would be kids from different teams warming up for practice and never acknowledge those kids. Never. Um, and I thought it was incredibly disappointing because um, he could have been building some credibility uh, with those students and he could have been showing them that he has his back. So I think it's important to make sure that those intangible things, um, you know, have some grace, have some patience. There are going to be some bumps in the road with your people, but as you help them grow, it's really important for employee morale to make sure that they get a pat on the back and that they understand that without lowering your expectations or standards, you're going to be there to support them. Um, the second way is to find ways to uh, give your people small wins whenever you implement change. Change is hard, but change is necessary. As a business, you don't want to be stagnant. You always want to have the latest equipment, software, um, you know, the best people. Uh, but you got to make sure that when you implement change that your people experience wins. So what are you doing for the older employee to support his concerns or her fears about, um, you know, an, learning a new software? Um, how are you addressing those fears and concerns, making sure that you support their learning curve and ease their stress um, in that learning curve? I think that's really important. For the younger employees, how are you supporting them, helping them learn to be responsible, to be accountable, to be a professional? Uh, not all young people today have grown up being taught uh, work ethic, or they have maybe a different perception of what work, e work ethic is um, than you. And so making sure that you are being patient with them, uh, giving them some grace, but also helping them understand the standards that it takes, uh, the standards of excellence that you expect in your organization. The third thing is uh, conduct yourself with uh, integrity and honesty. Nothing turns people off more than a leader who is disingenuous, who does not lead by example, who does not uh, keep her word, who does not do the things that he says he's going to do really, really important. Now, it's okay not to be perfect, you know, as a leader, you're going to make mistakes and you cannot make everybody happy. But I think you have to own your decisions and, um, you know, be humble enough to admit when you're wrong. I recently was watching this really great um, documentary on the History Channel about John F. Kennedy. And one of the things that struck me was that he wanted to make a speech after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. And obviously his uh, advisors did not want him to make that speech to the American people. They felt it would negatively impact the polls, right? There's always a poll for the president of the United States. But, but he felt so strongly um, that he did it anyway. And he said, an error is not a mistake unless you refuse to correct it. And after he finished that speech, um, you know, there was a poll that was obviously, uh, they had a poll after that, and everyone was shocked, including uh, President Kennedy, because the poll stated that 83% of American people were still behind him, because he told the truth, because he was honest, because he was forthcoming. So that's a great example uh, of integrity. I used to coach at the Naval Academy, and one of their favorite, one of my favorite models uh, is honor, courage, and commitment. That's what every midshipman lives by. And it's so easy to say, but really difficult to live. And so I think about a lot that a lot when I'm making decisions, um, you know, in my life, the, the ethics and integrity is so key to buy in. It's so key to employee morale. A few other things that I think can help you with buy in with your employees that will increase your morale. Uh, Number one, humble self-reflection. Are you consistently evaluating if you are leading by example? Is your competitive capacity growing? Do you seek out opportunities to get better, to improve yourself as a leader, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's spiritual? Um, are you reading books? Are you talking to people? Uh, attending this digital summit is a great example of you trying to increase your competitive um, capacity. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're always uh, 
in a growth mindset and making sure that you're doing things to, to get better. Second thing, read the room. Uh, EQ, emotional intelligence, is so important, sometimes more than the, the technical things, because um, you, know, you want to make sure that you understand how what you do and say impacts your people. Uh, there's an old parable that I like, and it, it, it says, um, you know, when you hammer a nail in the fence, you can take the nail out, but the hole is still there. And so consider this when you're interacting with people in terms of how you make them feel with what you say and what you do. And that includes, you know, your staff, um, understanding what they need, having the emotional intelligence to see what particular areas they need to get better in. Um, they're coaches for their uh, people as well, and um, coaches need coaching too. So what kind of training are you giving them, especially in the area of emotional intelligence? Because everything is about relationships. Every uh, successful entity organization, they have great relationships. They have great open communication. So consider that. Think about what is your EQ? The third thing is careful listening. We must be present with people and not just physically. We must be present mentally. Uh, say, for instance, in your, your uh, individual meetings or if someone needs to come and have a conversation with you. Uh, I think that's really important. When I was a head coach and I would meet with my players, um, I would meet them on their turf as often as I could. Try not to meet them in the office. I would go to the cafeteria or the student center or maybe the quad where we would meet outside because I wanted them to feel comfortable. If we did have to meet in my office, I made sure that there were no barriers, be it literal or figurative. So my phone was always off and I was never behind my desk. I didn't want anything to uh, to separate us because I wanted the player to feel comfortable. And I also wanted to make sure, it's the phrase I use, is you want to keep your third eye open. You need to see and, and hear the things that are not being said because often those words that are not being said or what the crux of the issue is. And so if you're not present, if you don't listen carefully, if you're uh, only listening to be able to give an answer, um, I don't think that's gonna be effective. And the person that you're meeting with is obviously uh, going to see that. Now, sometimes people just need to be heard. They're not always looking for solutions. But again, going back to your emotional quotient, what is your EQ, your emotional intelligence? Um, and then I think the, the last thing that I want to talk about is, uh, well, not the last thing, next to the last thing is solicitation of opinions. You need to ask the opinion of all your people, not just your executive staff, because often the people that are in the trenches and are doing the job on a day-to-day -day basis, they have great ideas. They know where the kinks are. They know where the pain points are. And so it would behoove you to solicit their opinions when you're coming up with, um, you know, uh, operational standards for your organization. So many times the people on high, the executive staff, they come up with these great ideas, but it's the people that are in the trenches that have to implement those ideas. And so they need to be consulted to make sure that those pain points are addressed correctly. And then finally, open this to new ideas. You don't have to have all the answers. That was one of the things that I learned as a head coach is I don't have to have all of the answers. Um, you hire competent people, obviously, who are intelligent, who are trained, who are aware of what issues are. And it doesn't always have to be your ideas in your way. When I delegated, what I would do is I would answer three questions. Number one, what did I want? Number two, why did I want it? And number three, I would give them a time frame because I wanted them to have context. I didn't just want to delegate and say, do this or do that. And I only had one requirement, which was uh, whatever you do had to be moral. It had to be legal and it had to be, um, it had to have some, some integrity, right? Wanted to make sure that it was moral, legal, and ethical. And then go forth and do your thing. Um, I just wanted the results. My way might not always be the best way. There are different ways to approach situations. So just go forth and do your thing. Just follow those few parameters that I would give you when I would, when I would delegate. So when you're thinking of employee morale, 
the office parties, the retreats, the team activities, those things at some point will end. Um, you want to make sure that um, you're in it for the day to day, the day to day consistency that will go a long way and that will uh, develop and improve your employee morale. And, and to be honest with you, it'll keep people around. Like I said, it's not always money that, um, you know, that make people leave. Sometimes people just want to be acknowledged and, and valued and make, they, they need to make sure that you need to make sure that uh, you communicate how important their contribution is. Now welcoming expert guest speaker, Stephen Stasjak to the virtual stage. Employee engagement is crucial if you want your employees to feel like they've got the self-worth. You know, praise, praise is huge. My father always used to say, you know, when you a little bit of praise goes a long way. And that used to make me feel good when I was working for a company. So what are some of the th other things that companies can do to foster employee engagement? Well, I mentioned outside activities a little bit ago, and I used to work for a, uh, a leadership company. Now, one of the things that we did was we would go into companies, companies would hire us rather, to perform team building events for their employees. Now, these team building events are huge. They're only two or three hours long, but when the employees come out, they not only feel appreciated that the company is willing to do um, a fun event for them, that they can engage and um, have some fun, and they feel this little bit of a self-worth. They feel their self-worth because their they know their company's spending some money on them, and they probably think in the back of their mind or realize in the back of their mind that this is going to be an enriching experience. So I'm going to give you an example. Well, one of the thing, one of the events that I used to perform was a uh, one of the team building events that I used to perform was a, a bike building event. Now that was one of the most more popular events, and it's really fun. It charges the employees up, and not only that, but it gets employees from different departments to learn cooperation to work with other departments to create, you know, success obviously or a winning situation for lack of better terms. So basically how this event <clears throat> is constructed is that there were probably 200 employees of, of an event that I can think of that I, I performed down in Jacksonville, South Carolina for Home Depot. You know that little company, Home Depot? Well, they had a big distribution cent center down there for the Southeast. And um, what we what our mission was to get these people to break out of their silos. And this is what some companies are guilty of. I should say departments are guilty of. They, they try to win in their department. Okay. They're all for their department. They, they want to, they want to shine. They want to outdo the other departments, you know, to look good, obviously. But the mission here is to get everybody from all departments working together for one great result. Now, how do we do this? So we separate people that came in the team building event. And there were probably 200 of them into different teams. Now, these te teams would probably have, let's see, about uh, maybe uh, we did 20 groups and there were 10 people in each group. Now, how we picked them was, was we would pick people from different departments. They'd get a deck of cards. We'd have cards up there, 52 cards, and each of them would pull a card and they would end up in different uh well, they would end up in groups with people from different departments. Now, some people turn their nose up that in the beginning. They go, oh, my God, so I'm working with this guy, somebody I compete with. But as the team building event went on, they'd start working together. They'd be, they'd, they'd be working together in harmony to create one big success. And the success was to build a bike. Now, those bikes had seven parts. And their mission was obviously to build that bike as quick as they could, or I should say their, their motivation was to build the bike as quick as they could to be able to win their, uh, so their team would win. So the smart leader, <clears throat> smart teams would allocate the trivia questions, which would be, uh, which would have to be answered to be able to, uh, to, to earn the bike parts 
to be able to get the bike parts quicker to build a bike quicker to win right the winner would be the winner was the, the, the uh <clears throat> excuse me the group that would build a bike fast so everybody was feverishly um trying to answer those trivia questions to build those bikes quicker so this, once again the smart leaders would allocate the, the trivia questions to the people that knew that were were experts in that area and they'd probably just ask them who knows sports better who knows tv and entertainment better and so on and so forth who knows gardening better in any case so the idea behind this was to not only get these teams working together but to work together with those other groups that were in the room building the bikes now how do we do that so basically what we would do the people that would uh hand the uh, bike parts to them after they got the correct question right trivia question right would hand them a bike part there were seven bike parts now they'd come up let's say they answered a trivia question correctly they'd come up and get a bike seat okay then someone else would answer a question in that group they'd come up and they'd give them another bike seat they, and the person would go well wait a minute here i just we just got a bike seat the person would throw the person dispensing the bar, bike parts would throw their hands up and go I'm sorry sorry so they were scratching their head the people from that group that got the two seats were scratching their head and they said oh, what's going on here all of a sudden it would dawn on them maybe those people over there got two handlebars so let's look at that group so they would they would go over to that group and they find they had two handlebars so they would trade right they trade the seat for the handlebars so now they're on the way to build a bike successfully to try to win so basically what happened here is you're not only getting people that don't know each other in groups working together but you're having people in other groups that don't know each other you may you know, may not knew that group either but you're working together as one great system to so that you can have a uh, so that your team can win so all in all what this taught them was that they can work together no matter you know, if it was another department or another group in the team building event to be able to complete their bike to win. Valuable lesson here, folks. One simple team building event just like that will get these people on, on one page. So when they went back to work on Monday, guess what? Instead of working in their silos, they'd say, hey, I've got a problem over here. Do you guys have a solution to solve this problem? Oh, yeah, sure. That's what this is created to do. And the company was good enough to be able to put this together for not only employee engagement, to help the production process, for the company to be more successful as a whole. So if you're wanting to increase employee engagement, things like team building events, recognizing employee value, having periodic meetings to find out what the employees are looking for to enhance their job, how they can bridge the gap between the management and the, uh, the management and employees, how they can get more support, have open meetings with the management and open communication. All this creates this employee engagement. All this creates success for a company. So if you want to engage your employees, if you want a better system, exercise employee engagement. You'll be glad you did. Now, welcoming expert guest speaker, Tori Smith, to the virtual stage. Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Tori, founder of the Empathic Gangster Lifestyle brand and creator of the Harmonic Living series. I'm a channeler, a spirit advisor, a cosmic thought leader, motivational speaker, graphic artist, and author, and I specialize in divine cosmic consciousness and galactic attunement, which is who we are galactically and what we are holographically. So everything is always moving and shifting and changing always, and what it entails to navigate the universe isn't really any different than what it entails to navigate the ever-changing workplace. So the experience of self-mastery is the ability to organize a whirlwind, right? The ability to jive and jazz and dance and flow with all that is, and knowing how to navigate any waters competently and confidently. So I've done many a case study in my time, and nothing leads to more assumption, speculation, and confusion than one not being able to articulate their perspective. So 
It's also really important to be able to intentionally leave room for mystery and mystique and surprise and magic. And this is often an innate gift, but it's also a skill set that can be harnessed and mastered as well. So utilize your personality, lean into your innate gifts and talents, and get to know absolutely everyone that you work with so that you know how to collaborate and make magic together effectively and efficiently. Um, I draw most of my inspiration and understanding for my passions and my experiences and then I will copy paste that and I will put it into new arenas and new projects so it's really interesting because people will often notice when a person is like quote unquote good at everything but the truth of the matter is it's simply a way of operating right so they approach basically everything with the same level of experience tact and finesse and understanding they know how they operate in their strongest categories and then they integrate that into new ones so uh, if you have ever been an athlete a server a bartender an artist an entertainer of ev any kind uh, you understand pivoting flowing organizing chaos into an elegant and eloquent productive experience so utilize that understanding and approach new opportunities with that same understanding because at the end of the day organization intentional pace setting patience, delegation, prioritization, and teamwork is what makes all successful. Now welcoming expert guest speaker Edward Moorfield to the virtual stage. Okay, let's start by asking this question. How many of you have ever felt misunderstood in your workplace? Perhaps there was a moment when your ideas, your concerns, how you've been raised, your culture, how you view the world, maybe even your very identity didn't seem to resonate with those around you. It's a challenging and often lonely feeling, and even worse, it's very judgmental, isn't it? Now imagine that feeling wasn't just a moment, but a persistent experience that shapes the way you navigate your day-to-day -day interactions and creates that lens with which you see the world through and shapes how you view that world. This experience of not feeling understood, of being seen, but not truly acknowledged or valued for your experiences and how the world's impacted you, is a common thread that runs through the stories of many employees worldwide. It highlights a critical gap in our workplaces, one that we aim to address through diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So with that, today I wanna to talk to you about empathy. This is my cornerstone when it comes to how I like to implement DEI in our workplaces. It's a word we hear often, but don't always fully grasp in its depth. Empathy is more than just understanding someone's emotions or putting yourself in their shoes. It's about relating to and valuing another person's lived experience, even if it's not the same lived experience that you had. And even more so if it's an experience that you don't necessarily agree with. In the context of DEI, empathy is the bridge that connects us to each other that transcends our individual differences. We all have our own experiences that shape how we see the world. Things in our family, things in our culture, our environment, our life. Our upbringing, culture, education, and our personal history influence our perspectives and our beliefs. These are valuable, but they're not universal. We each have our own lens with how we see the world. The challenge arises when we assume that our way of seeing the world is the only way, or even worse, that it's the correct way. There's no correct way, y'all. When we approach our colleagues solely through our own lens, that we think that our way is the right way, there's no such things as intrinsic biases, we risk dismissing or minimizing someone else's experiences. We might unintentionally impose our own beliefs, expecting them to conform to our reality. This is not just about deferring opinions. It's about the fundamental way we understand and relate to each other. And in a diverse workplace, this lack of understanding can create barriers to true inclusion. It can create disdain and affect morale on an even deeper level. So let's delve into this even deeper. Each of us has been shaped by the environments we grew up in, the cultures we were exposed to, the values we were taught, and the ideologies we've absorbed. This process is often referred to as indoctrination, and it starts early and continues throughout our lives. It starts from 
our adolescent years, how we were raised in our family, our culture, our cities, our neighborhoods, whatever it may be. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's how societies maintain continuity and how we find our place in the world. However, indoctrination has a downside. It can create a very rigid belief system that we carry into our adult lives, including our workplaces. That we that our lens that we see the world through is the only lens the world should be seen through. These belief systems can lead us to judge others by our own standards, often without realizing that our standards are just one of many possible perspectives. There's not necessarily any one right way. We all have our own experiences that shape us in who we are. No one way is the right way. But here's the key point. Just because we've been taught to see the world a certain way doesn't mean it's the only way or even the best way. And that is okay. In fact, it's more than okay. It's essential for building a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace. To foster true DEI in the workplace, we must begin by acknowledging that our personal experiences, while valid, are not universal. We need to stop viewing others solely through our own lens and start appreciating the rich diversity of experiences that our colleagues bring to the table. We need to be able to stop and take a moment to look at someone else's lens and think about what it looks like to look through their lens and how they see the world. This requires a shift in mindset. Instead of trying to make others fit into our worldview, we should strive to understand theirs. And even if you can't understand it, that's okay. At least acknowledge it. As human beings, all we want is to be acknowledged. This does not mean abandoning our own beliefs, but rather expanding our capacity for empathy. It means listening, really listening when someone shares their story, their pain, their traumas, everything they've been through, and recognizing that their truth is just as valid as ours, even if it's not the same. When we embrace this approach, we open the door to deeper connections and more meaningful collaboration. We create an environment where everyone feels valued, understood, and included. This in turn fosters innovation, creativity, and a sense of belonging that can transform our workplaces on a whole new level. As leaders in these workplaces, it's our responsibility to model this empathy in our daily interactions. As leaders, we must lead. We must be intentional about creating spaces where diverse voices are heard and respected. This means challenging our own assumptions and being open to learning from others. It means leading with humility, being humble enough to acknowledge that we don't have all the answers, and that's okay. Leadership in DEI is not about enforcing conformity, and that's where the mistake often happens. It's about cultivating an environment where diversity thrives. It's about recognizing that each person's experience is unique and valuable, and that our differences are not something to be tolerated, but celebrated. So I leave you with this right now, this call to action. Let's commit to expanding our empathy. And you gotta remember, empathy is not sympathy. We're not feeling sorry for anybody. We're trying to be empathic and understand and relate to. So we need to shift our lens. Let's move beyond the comfort of our own experiences because it's gonna be uncomfortable. But we need to embrace the diverse perspectives of those around us by doing so. We can create a workplace where everybody feels understood, valued, and empowered to contribute their best. Remember, the goal of DEI is not to erase our differences, but to honor them. It's about building a community where every person's story is heard, even if you don't agree with it, where every voice matters. And it starts with us by choosing to see the world not just through our own eyes, but through the eyes of others as well. Now, welcoming expert keynote speaker, Maya Madkor, to the virtual stage. Hello, my name is Maya Madkor. I'm an international keynote speaker, PhD candidate and author. I'm also a positive psychologist and well-being expert. And today I'm delighted to talk to you about change and change management and how we can as leaders and staff people and employees and just individuals really in life and at work manage change in a way that serves us, in a way that does not deplete us, in a way that actually energizes us. Because change is the only constant in life, we all know that, but how can I use change to my benefit? How 
How can I use change to my advantage? How can I harness the power of change to transform me into the person that I know I'm destined to become? So that's essentially what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, most of us fear change uh, because it's wired in our genetics, it's wired in our brain, it's wired in our biology. That's how the human race has survived for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years and eons, because we are programmed to resist change. The subconscious mind is programmed to resist change because if we were to play around with a saber-toothed tiger tens of thousands of years ago, we wouldn't even be here to talk about it. So we are wired to stay within the confines of our comfort zone, not knowing that outside, if you just take a few steps out and venture out into the unknown, venture out of your comfort zone, that a whole new, beautiful, delightful, incredible world actually awaits you. But we are, again, designed to want to stay within our comfort zone, to not desire change, to fear change, to shy away from change, not knowing that change can actually be your friend. You can harness the power of change to fulfill your potential and become all that you can possibly be. So how do you do that? So just a few things about our background in terms of, again, why we fear change. Some fear change on an effective level. They don't feel good about change. They're just, this is me. It's how I've always... I have, you know, how I've always done things. I'm not going to change. This is it. You know, stagnation. That's essentially <laughs> another word for stagnation. So it's an effective response to change, emotional uh, response to change. Another response to change can be cognitive, like how you think about change in general, whether you are the type of person that embraces change, whether you're the type of person that resists change. Um, and all of those things are actually fixable and malleable and changeable uh, with the right training and with the right mindset. And then behavioral. So you can, um, when it comes to change, you're like, this is what I'm going to do if my position changes at work. This is what I'm going to do if so-and-so does this. This is what I'm going to do if my boss tells me this or that. So it's kind of your action plan um, in terms of behavior uh, when you are met with a specific uh, change, right? So how do you address that and how do you start harnessing the power of change to your own advantage is start small this is essentially you tricking your brain into change because like i said we're wired to stay within the confines the very rigid kind of confines of our comfort zone so how do you address that you trick your mind by taking very small steps you know be like you know what mind relax chill i got this <laughs> start taking some very small steps um those small steps are not going to lead to resistance of any sort from your conscious and subconscious are small let's say you want to lose weight that was my weight loss journey anyway you know it started by i'm not gonna i'm gonna have a healthy dinner tonight i don't need to hit the gym every single day and you know eat salads and grilled foods all the time i just started with like you know what i'm gonna have a healthy dinner tonight and then that actually ended up snowballing into like, hmm, I had a healthy dinner last night. Why not have a healthy breakfast today, this morning? And then it just starts to snowball. And bit by bit, as you make these micro decisions, these micro moments, they add up and they transform your very being. I think most of us fear change and most of us shy away from change because we think it's going to be this grand gesture of like doves flying in the sky and like oh my god i'm this incredibly new person and you know just completely someone else change does not happen that way change happens very gradually almost imperceptible at first um just very small steps with intention coupled with a very clear visceral laser sharp vision of where you want to go where you want to go where you want to end up you're going to be able to get there but you need to know where you want to go you need to know who you want to be you need to know where you want to end up and then start taking very small steps to becoming that person and you will it really is that simple deceptively simple almost and i think because it's so simple people tend to shy away from it it seems like a mystery it seems like it's an unknown but it's not right we're we're deciphering the the mystery today so yeah, start small and watch it snowball, and it will snowball. You start seeing yourself in a new light, you start behaving in a new light, you start um, cultivating this newfound kind of healthy respect for yourself. You're like, oh my God, I actually got this. I know what I'm doing. This is really cool. And all you have to do is start small. Like if you wanna to go to the gym, for instance, you don't have to go for, for a whole entire hour the first time you get there. Just get there, hit the treadmill, you know, hit the elliptical, be like, I'm gonna be there for maybe 10 minutes today. And before you know it, you're like, hmm, why don't I just stay for 20 minutes? And then the next time you end up going to the gym, it's gonna be a good 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. It starts adding up, it starts snowballing, right? So you need motivation and resilience, obviously, to instigate change without motivation. I'm obsessed with motivation. 
I love motivation. I just wrote a book on motivation. So motivation is what gets you there um, and resilience because there will be times when you are unable to make a change. There will be times going back to the you know theme of dieting and being healthy and stuff. There will be nights when you're like craving takeout or craving you know a burger or whatever. It's not the end of the world if you have you know if you satisfy your cravings every now and then but it's the work that you do day in and day out is actually what builds the structure of the new person that you're becoming that's essentially what it's all about right and then so plan ahead you need to have a plan for how you're going to make a change having a plan is key um you need to know where you're going like i said earlier and implement that plan that's going to take you very 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 far right so you need to know where you're going having that clarity is so key is so paramount and you need to know where you're going, but you don't need to have all the steps figured out as of yet. All you have to do is have a destination in mind. Understand that it's the journey. It's all about the journey and how you get there. That's the key. It's the transformation. It's the person you become. That's, you know, what makes this process so beautiful and so enticing and so incredible. And you kind of have to try it to feel it, to understand it. And that's what I, uh, I'm recommending for you today. And, you know, like Martin Luther King said, you don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. All you have to do is take the first step. And as you take that first step, the second step will be made manifest. And the third step will be made manifest. And the fourth step will be made manifest. Have faith that each and every step will be made manifest for you.